Hello, church family. Welcome to this worship service for December 12th. This is the third Sunday of Advent. I am Stacy Oliveira, and I'm your liturgist for today. We have a few announcements for you. Uh, the college-aged group will be Zooming this afternoon at 1 p.m. And a reminder to those who haven't turned in your pledge card, it's still not too late. We will be working on the budget this month for the next year, and we're still working on sending out confirmation letters, which will be coming soon. Thank you to all who have submitted their pledges. Also, we want to remind you that we are collecting money over the next few Sundays through the first Sunday of January for our staff to be divided for their Christmas gifts. A wrapped box is located at the back of the church and you can leave your donation on your way out. Um, we have decided not to participate in St. Peter's Episcopal Church's Las Posadas Parade. Uh, logistics were just too difficult and there wasn't enough time to plan. Uh, in the meantime, the cast for the musical, Twas the Night Before, is busy rehearsing. Um, our next rehearsal is Tuesday, December 14th at 6 p.m. The Christmas Eve services are at 5 p.m. and the music with the musical, excuse me, and then the 11 p.m. service is the traditional format with hymns and carols, readings, and a message. Both will have Holy Communion and candlelight. Uh, because of the holidays, please submit newsletter letter articles toward the middle of this week to Pastor Bob. And during the week, if there are any concerns that we need to know about, or if you have any prayer requests, you can leave your messages at the church contact, 805-925-9573, uh, or at fumcsmc at gmail.com. Or you can contact Pastor Bob directly. Please rise as you are able as we join the praise team. Oh, my God. 
to invite Chris Liana Anderson and Noah Antonio to come up for the lighting of the Advent candles. It's a reunion. Every time we go home, every time we embrace those we love, no matter how long it has been, it feels like sunrise, like the clouds are parting and the rain has ended. It is joy, nothing less pure joy to grab hold of those who are home for us, who make home for us, whether we wake up to them every day or travel many miles to see them again. It is joy to go home. Zephaniah 314 to 20. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart. O daughter, Jerusalem, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. 
On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time. And I will save the lame and gather the outcast. And I will change their shame into praise and re own in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home. At that time, when I gather you, for I will make you re owned and praised among the, all the peoples of the earth. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. The prophet Zephaniah tells us to rejoice at the thought of going home. The prophet tells us to imagine being set free, being unburdened, being released to live, to fully live in the grace and wonder of life itself, surrounded by those who love us like no one else. And then to live like that was our truth even now, even here. It is a joy to go home. Luke 3, 7 to 18. John said to the crowds that came out to baptize by him, you brood of vipers who warn you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits worthy of repentance, to not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up to children to Abraham. Even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Even every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do in reply? He said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers are also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah. John answered, them all of them, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. John the Baptist reminds us, however, that it takes choices to live in this joy. It doesn't just happen. We choose to make life a joy by how we love others, by how we serve and give and care for the others by how we do this job we do and how we impact the world around us. We build joy as we build a home in this world and the next. Please join us in prayer. O oh Lord, our God, we light these candles, the candle of hope and of peace and a joy as a sign that we are on our way home and we walk with the skip in our step because we can see the destination and it is pure joy it is time to go home amen Hymnal number 203, Hail to the Lord's Anointed, verses 1, 2, and 3. We would like to thank Ernesto Sanchez for leading the hymn singing and with Jed Beebe accompanying him on the organ. Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. Hail in the 
time appointed his reign on earth begun. He comes to break oppressions, to set the captive free, to take away transgression and rule in equity. He comes with succor speedy to those who suffer wrong, to help the poor and needy, and bid the weak be strong, to give them songs for sighing, their darkness turn to light. Whose souls condemned and dying, and precious in this sight. He shall come down like showers upon the fruitful earth. Love, joy, and hope like flowers spring in his path to concerns and raise up prayers and uh, for the past week. Uh, today, Lester Valenzuela is at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. He had graduated last year, but the school was delayed in having the commencement ceremony due to COVID, so it's today. Um, Lester is to receive his Bachelor Science degree in Psychology and so congratulations to Lester and his family for his accomplishment. <laughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Uh, Lou Melton uh, celebrated a birthday this past week, but she did also tell me she has uh, colds, so we lift up Lou Melton at this time. Lord, in your mercy. I don't know who would that be there. <laughs> Thank you. I'm looking forward to that senior discount pretty soon. <clears throat> and so uh, we lift up, um, well, Lord, thank you for another year, another birthday, and uh, continue to ask for health and um, strength uh, in serving uh, throughout the years, and we just pray for more years. Lord, in your mercy. Um, so we have several concerns. Um, Diane Beebe had mentioned that her brother-in-law had passed away and the family is in Illinois. And so what a tough time to lose a loved one. Um, and so we lift up um, her brother-in-law's family and their family and um, all those who are near. Um, place your hand upon them, O oh God, and help them to feel your presence. Lord, in your mercy. So our organist, Jed Beebe, um, will be undergoing heart surgery uh, this coming Wednesday at Marion Hospital. So we will be missing him for several uh, Sundays and we will miss his musical talents for the rest of the Advent season. So I would invite you um, at this time to just uh, stretch out your hand as we pray for Jed. Oh God, we ask for successful surgery and for patience throughout the process. 
And together as a church, we extend our hands and we ask that you place your hand upon him and the surgeons and the medical staff. And we pray for Diane for strength as she will be attending to him during his recovery. And so, oh God, uh, be with them in this tough time and also uh, the family who may be uh, coming and traveling to be with him and to care for him. Lord, in your mercy. Uh, this past week, I attended one of my aunt's funeral in the Philippines on my father's side through Facebook streaming. And so I pray for my Uncle Will and Aunt Jean, who are just the remaining siblings, um, and also for the whole family who lost their sister. So for uh, Auntie Opie and the rest of the family, we remember her. Lord, in your mercy. We continue to lift up Rowena Lara and Elvis Jr. and family. Uh, tomorrow they will be gathering for their 40th day death anniversary of his passing. So Lord, in your mercy, continue to comfort them. Hear our prayers. So now we turn to our ongoing list. For Esther Jensen's sister Joyce Wood, Robin Granville's daughter Michelle Latimer and baby Peter Israel, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We lift up Luana Martel's granddaughter, Cheryl Ann, her great-granddaughter, Haley, and great-grandson, Joseph, who did receive the kidney biopsy, but now they are awaiting the results. But now we also add to their list grandson, Wesley, who is going to have some kind of surgery um, on December 21st to correct something that's wrong with his breastbone and he is just 13 years old. And also we mention Luana because she is awaiting surgery as well. Lord, in your mercy. We also name before you, O oh God, Cheryl Curry, Liz Young, Kit Lemos, Phyllis Keys. Lord, in your mercy. We name also Ed and Peggy Hewell who are on hospice. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up Delia Valenzuela, Jean Rigsby's sister, Darnell Lambright, Alice Coop, the Granville family, Jim and Suzanne's daughters, uh, Tiffany Lee and Jamie, and uh, Suzanne did tell me that some cats, or a cat was involved uh, in, in the troubles this week, so we lift up the healing of that uh, cat, Lord, in your mercy. We also name Derek Tinsley and Marlou's brother, Koya Alex, and her cousin, Bon, who is recovering from COVID. Lord, in your mercy. We take a moment to lift up those who are victims of the tornadoes this past week in our country. We pray for comfort and faith in the face of this tragic loss and devastation, the loss of loved ones, and we pray for the responders and those who are uh, involved in the cleanup and the rebuilding. O Lord, send your spirit uh, to those places that they may know that others are praying for them and uh, that help is on the way. Lord, in your mercy. For all the families that we've named and the individuals, and we also take a moment to name others uh, who we haven't spoken of out loud. We take uh, a moment in our mind's eye to see their faces, to name their names. And we bring them to you and place them and their concerns at your altar. Lord, in your mercy. And so now we pause for the pastoral prayer. 
O God, you who sent the, us the prophets through the ages, you who called messengers and sages throughout scriptures, we give thanks this day for their testimony and witness of your impacting and in breaking presence. At times you make your presence felt through your mighty thunderous acts in nature, at times through a still small voice, at times through the birth of the one who was barren, at times through miraculous healings, and many times through the touch of humble servants. As we take in the stories of Advent and the themes of this season, we are blessed by the variety and diversity of all the imagery. We picture in our imaginations the angels and animals and shepherds and stars and wise men and all who surrounded the newborn. We think of all who adored and offered their praise and prayers. And like them, we make that trek and we travel through our own tough times and rough terrain. Like them, we anticipate beauty and glory in your majesty. And like them, we in seek inspiration and revelation and incarnation. O oh Lord, how you humbly entered the world for us that we may find salvation. And so as we experience once again the joy of the days ahead, we ask that you minister to those who are in sadness or in sorrow, that you fill up those who are empty and lonely, that you comfort those who are sitting in the midst of calamity and tragedy, and that you would reassure those who are afflicted that this is just for the moment and that it too shall pass. Help them to find hope and light. And may they reach the end of that long, dark tunnel that we can all be your agents and your instruments of outreach to those whom we encounter day to day. We continue with living and breathing and being. So we take in your holiness and your righteousness deeply within our lungs. And then we exhale that which is unhealthy, that which is hurtful, or that which is not helpful. Minister to us mind, body, and soul, and from head to toe, and through every cell in our bodies. As we lower our shoulders and open our lungs, clear our conscience, and wipe our slate clean. So now we pray the prayer that was taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. During the season of Advent, we anticipate the arrival of Christ Jesus once again into our hearts and our homes. The gift of God's Son to the world is an incarnation of grace and mercy. God's generous abundance that fills the world with wisdom and teaching and new ways of living. We give acknowledgement God's love for us and our love in return. I invite you to return thanks through your offering. For those of you who are in person, you may drop your money or check in the boxes located at the back of the sanctuary. If you are viewing online, you may mail a check to First UMC at Santa Maria, 311 South Broadway, Santa Maria, California, 93454. A third option is to go to our website, santamariafumc.net, and click the Give button. Follow the prompts. Thank you for your support of Christ's ministry in this place. Our offertory is a previous recording of Comfort Ye from Handel's Messiah, performed by Mark Gladson and Jed Beebe at the piano.
and shepherds and wise men and servants and scripture. We are grateful for the whole event and story leading up to the nativity. As we ready ourselves for Christ's arrival, we gather as a community and family to give more, to give generously, to give joyfully, that we too become part of the story, that we further the good news to all the corners of this world. So bless the gifts and the labors of those who earn and offer them for Christ's sake. Amen. You may be seated. (laughs) Sorry about that. Our gospel reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? 
In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, teacher, what should we do? He said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to unthigh the thongs of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chafe he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our anthem this morning is a previous recording of Every Valley from Handel's Messiah, performed by Mark Gladson with Jed Beebe at the piano.
Our thanks to uh, Mark Gladson. Uh, Mark is employed by another church in San Luis Obispo, but he still wants to keep uh, connected to us and participating where he can, so we appreciate um, his service. Let's pause for prayer. Oh God, make sense of this story about John the Baptist, that we may understand it, that we may take it in, that we may digest it, that would be helpful and useful meaningful for this day and the days ahead. So may all that we send do be glorifying to you, O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Stephen Sondheim, who passed away recently, is known for the musical West Side Story. In the musical, there is a character named Tony, and he sings this song called Something's Coming. And the words are this. Could it be? Who knows? There's something due any day. I will know right away as soon as it shows it may come cannonballing down through the sky, clean in the eye, bright as a rose. Who knows? It's only just out of reach. I got a feeling there's a miracle due gonna come true coming to me could it be yes it could something's coming something's good if I can wait something's coming and I don't know what it is but it's gonna be great that song is expressing anticipation and it's looking forward to something happening and that's what the season of Advent is all about it's it's anticipating it's waiting or as Martin Copenhaver would say, it's a yearning. Today's scripture lesson is about John the Baptist, who's a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. As John is preaching and baptizing, the crowds are coming in to hear him. He is preaching that the time is at hand. And people are there in droves being baptized, and, and they must have had this deep yearning within for them to come way out there, out of the way, to get out of the city and into that barren and bleak landscape. What are they yearning for? What are they wanting? What are they needing? They may be yearning for things to be different in their lives, for things to be fresh and new and exciting, to get out of the doldrums and their dull life, or they may be yearning for stability or security or safety or some clear consistency in their life. They may be wishing for there to be an improvement in their situations, a better quality of life, a, a life of good health and healing. Or maybe they're yearning for deeper relationships, more authentic friendships, and to be connected with their family or their spouse, or wanting more honesty and sincerity in their interactions, less conflict and more peace and harmony. Much like what we are looking for, what we are yearning for today. But as, as the crowds are approaching John the Baptist, John the Baptist is not so welcoming. He's not so inviting. He's not so encouraging. John the Baptist is not there to comfort them and make them feel good or please them. But John the Baptist is dishing upon them some discomforts on their heads. He says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Maybe he said it even stronger than I could say it. He seems to be in a bad mood. Now Luke's version of this event, which we heard, is slightly different from Matthew's version. 
And the main difference is that in Matthew's version, John is addressing the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees in chapter 12 are calling him or somehow associating him with Beelzebub, that he is somewhat um, connected with the head of the demons. And so he lashes out, John lashes out at the Pharisees and says, you brood of vipers. But in Luke, he says that, you brood of vipers, not just to the Pharisees, but to everyone. You brood of vipers, you brood of vipers, you, you, you brood of vipers. He is saying that to everyone. And so he is just raining down upon them. He is not provoked by the Pharisees, according to Luke, but instead is to the whole crowd, to every single, everyone who wants to be baptized. It's almost like he is cursing at them, and he is sowing seeds of discomfort upon everybody. Now, you know that Christmas song, God rest ye merry gentlemen. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. John would rewrite that song and say, discomfort and joy. And I don't even know if John would use the word joy. The world is filled with discomfort and misery. And I'm sure that each one of you could name all your discomforts. When I go to the Philippines, my parents' motherland, there is discomfort all around. In Manila, when we were riding through, we would see this beautiful hotel, but right next to it, there would be squatters and shanties. And how can you not be dis uncomfortable about those living conditions? It is such a contradiction. Or at times we were traveling at night and I would see children out on the street, unsupervised, and they're trying to hustle for some food and some money. And it's very disturbing and troubling. But we don't have to tra travel abroad to find discomfort. How about when we hear about mass shootings in the high schools or in the shopping malls? And the consequences of all the injuries and casualties that causes us discomfort. Or what about when we see a person lying on the sidewalk sleeping in broad daylight? And that produces discomfort. I wonder at times where they're from or who their family is or where their home is or what their mother is thinking about them if she saw them. Or how about families who are begging on the street with young kids? And that gives us discomfort. Or what about social media when there's news about all these false truths or makeup stories theories circulating around that produces us discomfort. Name your own discomfort. Our tendency is to want to flee from, to ignore our discomforts, to push it aside and not think about it. Our natural tendency is to want to be delivered from it or to cover it up or not think about it. We want to be positive. We want to think good thoughts. And we want to squash down any discomforts that we may be experiencing or feeling or perceiving. But John the Baptist, he leads with discomforts. He hammers on the discomforts. You brood of vipers. 
in verse 8, John points out that the people are claiming that they are privileged because they are sons of Abraham. And they deserve to be treated a certain way. They deserve preferential privilege. We deserve better. We deserve the best. And then John says, well, God can raise up sons of Abraham from these stones, which sounds ridiculous, but it touches a nerve and it makes them feel discomfort. Because ultimately, John is saying, your family doesn't matter, your lineage, your ethnicity, your nationality. It doesn't set you apart for being more comfortable. And then in verse 9, John goes the next level of discomfort. He says to them that the tree will be cut down if it doesn't bear fruit. The ax is already there at the roots. And then the tree will be thrown into the fire. That's very disconcerting. That's very uncomfortable that they would chop down and burned up and in the fire if they don't bear fruit. Marlou, when she was listening to this, she said, well, John the Baptist must be hangry all the time. Maybe we would be too if all we ate was locusts and honey out there in the wilderness. But John doesn't have good bedside manner. He's not so charming. He's not so welcoming. He's you know that phrase, you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. Why can't John just be a little more tactful or gentle or peaceful rather than being so vengeful or hurtful or hateful or spiteful or whatever that mood is? It just seems like I can't imagine John the Baptist not have. maybe he just doesn't have a sense of humor, I don't know. But prophets, in general, rub people the wrong way. And they are unapologetic. And they are in your face. They don't hold back. And they are blunt. Why deal with people this way? It seems to me that he wants people to feel discomfort. He wants people not to ignore their discomfort. He doesn't want people to brush it aside, but he wants us to acknowledge our discomforts and to be aware of it and to be in touch with it, in tune and sobered by it. Otherwise, we just ignore it. Otherwise, we dismiss it. Otherwise, we're in denial or we deceive ourselves into thinking, well, life is all about finding comfort and getting more comfortable. So finally, the people say, okay, I hear you, John. What do we do? We realize that there are contradictions and inequities and disparities in this life. We know that some have a lot more comfort. Some are beset with more discomfort. What do we do? In a sense, when they ask John that question, they are answering their own questions. Because the answer is, what do we do? We'll do something to acknowledge the discomfort and be present with it. But do something. If you have extra clothes, well, share it. If you have extra food, well, share it. Verse 12, then, the tax collectors say, well, what do we do? And John says, well, collect only what you're supposed to do and do no more. Or the soldiers, they came in and say, well, what do we do? And they said, John says, don't abuse your power. Don't cheat people. Don't bring up false accusations. Be content with what you have. When I was on the, the bike ride this past summer, one of the riders was asking me, he said, 
Should we provide rental assistance to those people who can't make the payments? What if they lost their job to, uh, and I said to him, well, if they lost their job due to COVID and they can't make the payments and the, and the, the owner of the house can afford it, sure. And then he said to me, well, you're thinking like a socialist. And I said, I thought in my mind, well, you know, John the Baptist, I was thinking about him. John the Baptist would be saying, yeah, go ahead and help out. Absolutely. John the Baptist would also say, he would also be against being capitalist either. You know that one verse that says, be satisfied with your wages, how much you're earning? Well, none of us are satisfied with our wages. We always want more or need more or strive for more. We want to earn as much as we can. And so John's message then would be to do something about that discomfort and not do nothing. Do something to help alleviate others' tough situations. I'm so glad that we're collecting dry goods this Christmas. John the Baptist would be saying, yeah, good, you're doing something. But John the Baptist wouldn't say stop there. John the Baptist would say, but also repent. Oh, repent for what? Well, in this context, it would be not wanting to acknowledge our discomforts or denying or ignoring or suppressing our discomforts. Repent of being in denial. Repent of being so dismissive. So then we think, now, is, is John saying that this is salvation then? All these things that we are doing, is it salvation itself? To work towards sharing or distributing or equalizing or fixing society. In the broader scheme of God's salvation plan, these activities were actually to prepare us to receive Jesus. This is what they are supposed to do. This is what we are supposed to do in the process of receiving Jesus into our lives. To share food, to share clothing, and not to cheat people, and to be honest. But this is not salvation. Jesus is salvation. He is the source. He is the Savior. He is the point, salvation. And these acts of giving and sharing and distributing is not salvation itself, but a necessary activity in the preparation for the meeting of that yearning and desire to receive Jesus. Throughout the Gospels, many found salvation in Jesus, and Jesus didn't require them to do all these things, or what John was preaching about before that they had to accept Jesus. Many just experienced Jesus on the spot and found salvation. But for us in this season of preparation and reflection, it's, it's like a ritual, it's a, it's a spiritual practice for us, the giving and sharing and surrendering and repenting. Where, where is the joy then for John the Baptist? There's no joy for John in Luke, but John, Luke doesn't describe any, any sense that John has any joy, any reaction. But in a different gospel, John does have a reaction. In John's gospel, uh, there is joy or uh, not the gospel, yeah, in John chapter 1. The next day, G John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, 
Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. And so for John, the joy was in seeing for himself the unfolding and the fulfilling of the mission. And for John, the joy is in fulfilling his call and getting to see it with his own eyes in front of him. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven like a dove and remained on him, and I did not know him but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is God's chosen one. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus passing by and he says, look, the Lamb of God and the joy of seeing and accomplishing and fulfilling that mission. The joy of receiving the Savior and seeing the Spirit move in front of him in the midst of the mess of humanity, and brokenness and sinfulness. There's an Old Testament scholar, his name is Walter Brueggemann, and he says that the prophetic task of the church is to tell the truth in society that lives in illusions, to grieve in a society that practices denial, and to express hope in a society that lives in despair. The prophet John tells the truth. He grieves, but he also expresses hope in the midst of the despair. And that's what the season of Advent is all about. It's a tension between discomfort and joy. So I offer those thoughts for us in the days ahead together. Amen? Amen? Amen. Our closing hymn, we sang this last week, but we will sing again, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We'll just sing some different verses, verses 4 and 6 and 7. Let us stand together. <laughs> of Jesse's tree, an ensign of thy people be. Before the ruler silent fall, all peoples of thy mercy call. Rejoice, rejoice. Spring, come and cheer our spirits by thy justice here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadows put to flight. Rejoice! Rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, desire of nations, bind all people in one heart and mind. From dust thou brought us forth to life. Deliver us from earthly strife. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to
receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forever. Amen. Thank you.